So here we are, Journey to the Promised Land, Part 2. Do you remember last time we talked about how the beginning of this journey started when God heard that cry going up? It says, Exodus 2, God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God saw the people of Israel and God knew. So God knew their situation. But it wasn't until he heard their groaning that he started to respond. And when he responded, he didn't just hear their cry, he remembered his word, the covenant, the agreement that he had made with Abraham years before, about 400 years before. Genesis 12 it was, and God said to Abraham, he said, to your offspring I will give this land. So the promised land that we're talking about for these 10 weeks is the land of promise. It's a promised land because God had promised it to Abraham. And so they were just coming out as a result of that promise. And when that cry went up, as God so often does, he sent a saviour. And that saviour was Moses. And Moses was just a type of Jesus. Do you remember that word type? It means something in the Old Testament, maybe a person, a thing, a story that represents something in the New Testament. And the Bible is full of types. And particularly this story is full of types that are fully explained in the New Testament. One of those types was Moses, who was a picture of Jesus, our saviour. And do you remember he took them across the Red Sea? The place that he took them was a place called Migdol. And actually from there, God could have taken them over the north part of the desert. But he decided to take them down. And maybe that was because he didn't want them to go back. God could have taken the easy route over the top. And it's been calculated that it would have taken perhaps just 40 days to get Israel out of Egypt and into the Promised Land. But something happened that meant that they could not go in for 40 years. And the thing that happened was that they went into Canaan. They went into the promised land. uh, 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 Maybe, I don't know, a year, a couple of years later, they tried to get in. And God wanted them to go in. But when they saw the giants in the land, their hearts melted and trembled. And they said, we became as grasshoppers in their sight. And so we seemed to them. So they they, they had been slaves for several generations and they had no concept of God. There was no way they were going to get into this land and defeat their enemies unless they knew God, unless they knew his word, unless they dealt with the sin that was in them. And in Hebrews 3 verse 19, it says they were unable to enter in because of unbelief. And so because they didn't know God, they couldn't trust in him, they didn't trust in him, only two out of the 12 spies, do you remember, Caleb and Joshua. So their sin had to be dealt with, because that sin was going to be a handicap to them all the time. And so it took 40 years to deal with those things. And I pray that over these 10 weeks, we'll take these things seriously. I want to just say to you this morning that the message that I'm sharing right now today could change your life. It's changed my life. It's changing my life. It's such a big, important message. So don't take this just as a story. Apply it to yourself. Father, I pray this morning in the name of Jesus that you will reveal your word to us, Lord. Show us yourself within your word. Show us ourselves, we pray. Show us our saviour in Jesus' name. Amen. So the place that God took them was the waters of Mara, and you can see that's a little down uh, the road from Migdol. And It says when they got to this place that Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and they found no water. They were in a desert after all. And so after three days, they were desperate. They probably carried some water with them, but after three days, it had run out. And suddenly before them, they saw as as if like a mirage, they suddenly saw this oasis full of beautiful water. And they were very, very happy, excited, full of expectation as they ran, no doubt, down to this water. 
But the Bible says when they came to Marah, they could not drink the water. This is in Exodus 15, because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Mara. So the talk today is about bitterness. The first thing I want to say about bitterness, three things. The first thing was that the water was bitter. The water was bitter. The second thing was that they were bitterly disappointed. And you know, the higher our expectations are of people or a situation, the more we will be disappointed if it doesn't work out. The more we will be resentful of the thing not working out. This is true in families. There is more bitterness in families than anywhere else. There are more murders in England committed in the home than anywhere else. Because the expectation in ho the home is high. And if that expectation is not met, we can become very bitter, very disappointed with the people around us. Maybe our, our husband, our wife, our mother, our father, even our children. We can be disappointed and we become bitter in our hearts. And the third thing was that there was a bitter reaction. They reacted bitterly. And how did they react? It says the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? Okay, they're not going to blame God uh, because they don't really know him. So the nearest thing is Moses. They, they got, became bitter against, it, against him. So there were two things here, complaining and blaming. Complaining is bitterness against God. Bitterness is expressed in complaining against God. And secondly, it's, it's complaining against people. It's bitterness against people. Those two things. What does the New Testament say about bitterness? Hebrews 12, 15 says this. See to it, that's our responsibility, that no one falls short. No, uh, no one uh, fails to obtain the grace of God that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. Another translation, the New Living Translation, says this, Look after each other, so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness uh, grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. So the bitterness that starts in us has the capability of destroying many, of corrupting many, of defiling many. And those two versions, the first version kind of uh, uh, puts the responsibility uh, on looking after our, our own hearts, but also making sure that people in church receive the grace of God so that there is no bitterness. Some years ago, our neighbour who's left now was a professor of botany. That means uh, he, was, uh, he went around the world looking at plants and lecturing on plant life. And uh, he had some exotic things in his garden. But one day he came and knocked on our door and it was for not a very exotic plant reason. He came with a little, uh, a little bucket and a paintbrush and he said, there's something in your garden I need to look at. And in his garden, he had a weed, and that weed was called Japanese knotweed. And this Japanese knotweed, um, uh, just a tiny bit of it uh, can destroy a house. In fact, if you got a, in, in, in a few years ago, if you got Japanese knotweed in your garden, it was very difficult to sell your house. And there were checks for them. Um, and this little, uh, this little bit of knotweed, he wanted to paint it if he saw it. He did see some in our garden and he painted it with this vicious weed killer. Um, because if that were to grow, its root system, and you can see this now, is huge and it can destroy, it can pull down, it can break up a house. It's so strong. The root of bitterness is like that. If we let that bitterness grow, it will destroy our lives. It will take the sweetness out of our lives. It will take the sweetness out of our relationship with God. It can destroy a family. It can destroy a church for sure. And bitterness has even destroyed nations as it grows into resentment and anger and hatred and eventually murder. We have to keep a check. So let's deal with this bitterness. So what was the answer? Well, 
fortunately, while everybody else was complaining, there was one man that knew what to do. He cried to the Lord. He lifted up his eyes and he said, God, what am I going to do now? I've got a problem I can't solve. This morning, you might have a problem you can't solve as well. It's that feeling of bitterness and resentment in your heart. Situations that make you angry. You hear somebody's name mentioned, it makes you angry. You make up speeches in the night because of that bitterness in your heart. And we've all had it. I've had it. Making those speeches in the night uh, to defend ourselves, to attack the other person, because this bitterness has taken root. So we go to the Lord. Sometimes even though the answer is to forgive, even that seems difficult. So we start by going to Jesus and we say, Lord, please help me. The Bible says the Lord showed him a tree. So God's response to the prayer was to show him a tree. And I believe this is another type, another picture of Jesus. You know, in Deuteronomy, I think it is perhaps Leviticus. It says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And that tree, that wood, represented the cross of Jesus. The person cursed when they hung upon it. And it was him dying on the cross, taking the curse of God's judgment on himself. So uh, God showed Moses a tree. And what was it about that tree that we can learn of in terms of bitterness? Well, first of all, it says in the Garden of Gethsemane, which was the beginning of the cross, it was the prelude to the cross. Jesus was there with a terrible circumstance, much worse than any circumstance that you or I will ever face. And he said, Father, if you're willing, and I love the humanity here of Jesus, remove the cup from me. He said, this is too difficult to bear. And yet this one who was 100% God goes on and he says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And I don't know what your circumstance is. For me, sometimes it was my business. I had it for 25 plus years. Sometimes it was so heavy, such a burden. And, and, and I, I became, I found that, that difficult. And sometimes I was resentful about, I didn't want to go into work. I didn't want to face the difficult days. There may be other things for you. And I, I, I said to the Lord, if you're willing, take this cup from me. But as it worked out, I couldn't get rid of it that way. I had to wait and the right time came and the burden was lifted. And it was the time to sell that difficult business. Not my will, but yours be done. And I learned to thank God for it. Thank you for this trial. Thank you for this difficulty. Thank you for this difficult person. And that brought sweetness into my heart. So it's accepting the will of God. Things maybe that don't seem like the will of God, but God allows them in, even so that we would pray that God, that we would pray your will be done, change this. And sometimes God does. And sometimes he waits until he does. And then the second thing was Luke 23, 24, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. There are two things we have to do here. The first thing we have to receive that forgiveness that Jesus was giving to us. We have to say, Lord, forgive me for complaining. Forgive me, Lord. You give me so much. You give me life. You give me breath. You give me somewhere to live. You give me friends. You've given me all these things, Lord, and I'm complaining. Forgive me, Lord. It's a sin to complain. And he will wash us with his blood and he will cleanse us. And then the second thing is that we must forgive others. Now that's a decision we have to make. And what people have done to us is nothing to what our sin has done to God. But sometimes that doesn't make it any easier. But if we will not forgive our neighbour, if we will not forgive, then we will not we will not enjoy the good of God's forgiveness in our lives. Our lives will become bitter. Our hearts will become bitter. Matthew 18, you should read it. God hands us over to the tormentor until we sort this out and we agree we will forgive that person. And if you find that hard, come back to God and cry out to the Lord and say, God, I can't forgive them in my strength, but I'm asking you to. Do you remember Corrie Ten Boom uh, was faced with the person, uh, the officer that, that uh, sentenced her father to death? 
This man became a Christian, met her um, uh, in a meeting and asked for her forgiveness. And she said, Lord, I cannot. I cannot forgive him. And, and I ask you to fill my heart with your love. And she reached out her hand in obedience to him. And as she did, she felt that, uh, that Romans 5.5 5, love of God fill her heart for that prison officer in that concentration camp in the Holocaust. And God's forgiveness came in, but she cried out to the Lord as Moses did. And then it says in verse 25, he threw it into the water. You see, there is a call to action here. You can know the theory, but if you do not pray, if you do not thank, if you do not accept, if you will not forgive, then you will not get the sweetness. There is something for us to do. The Bible says the water became sweet. Hallelujah. God did a miracle. And God wants to do a miracle in our hearts. I believe God is preparing us for a promised land. At the end of this pandemic, we have an opportunity, a mission is being handed to us in Queen's Crescent. It won't no doubt be the only mission in our lives, but it's a new mission that I believe God is presenting to us a new life. To join with our brothers and sisters already in that Kentish Town Church so that we can be useful to him. And that's part to me of the promised land that's coming up. And I want my heart to be prepared. So let's pray. Let's forgive. Let's thank him and get our hearts sweet. And that obedience brought sweetness. The last verse we're going to talk about here, the last couple of verses, I'm going to read them out to you. It says, And there the Lord made a statute for them and a rule. And there he tested them, saying, If... You will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God. And if you will do, so there are two things, to listen and to do that which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. Where God reveals his name through the Bible, I am the Lord that heals you. Um, uh, I am Jehovah Jireh. I am uh, the Lord your peace. I am the Lord your righteousness. There's always an associated story with it. And it's interesting that the story of bitterness is associated with healing. God wants to bring healing into our lives. He wants to bring healing into our souls. He wants to bring healing into our relationships. So let's obey him let's pray shall we heavenly father we thank you for this simple story we thank you that you are the lord that heals us you thank you that you are the lord that went to calvary and demonstrated how to do this for us lord we thank you for the forgiveness that there is through the blood of Jesus. We thank you for the agony of the cross that you suffered and said, let not my will but yours be done. Father, we thank you for these things. Father, this morning where there are circumstances that are difficult, too difficult, that are bitter to us, forgive us for complaining, Lord. Today we just want to say yes to you, Lord. Yes, it's okay, Lord. I don't want this, but let your will be done in my life. Where we need to forgive, Father, we say, give us the grace to forgive that person, those people in this situation. We pray for the grace in Jesus' name. Amen.